It's Wednesday, April 14th. I'm Scott. I'm Ren. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art Festival 2010. Every time we do a mocha opener, you always kind of say it slow like that. It's hard to say. Let's do this. For the last, like, week, I've been rollerblading home from work in the city. It's going to rain tomorrow, though. Yeah, so I'm probably not going to do it tomorrow, which is fine, because I'm finally going to the DMV to give up the Otori license plate. Oh. It's the end of an era. I still have to go to the DMV also. I'm going to, I got to find a way that I, I need the to The one to, in Harlem is open until six. That's not late enough. I got like. Maybe eight. It's I have late. to go to the doctor, the dentist, and the DMV. And I, the, the, the three, three D's. D's. <laughs> that's pretty dangerous. Yeah. So I got to, I got to like schedule it to take the minimum time off work. Just take a day off and then use the day to dick around. Uh, and that's the four D's. <laughs> <laughs> doctor, Dennis, DMV, dick around. Well, the doctor might also involve some dicking. I mean, uh, hopefully not. The DMV, definitely. I mean, I need some doctoring, but not in the dick. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have some observations about rollerblading in New York City. You know, just almost no one does it. Uh, actually, today I, I ran think as into long as I've lived here, I've seen three people today. Total today, I ran into not literally. Three individual rollerbladers other than myself. Mm-hmm. And when I stopped and waited in an intersection... Did you ask them like where they were getting their like rollerblade stuff from? No, they were just going past me. I didn't mm. want to stop. Because, you know, rollerblades, it takes a while to get up to speed. You do not want to slow down. Yeah. That is the main reason why I'm on the sidewalk. Uh, anyway, mm. so observation number one, the most important one. Number of times Rim has almost been hit by a car running a red light... Zero! Uh Number of times Rim has almost been hit by a jackass bicyclist running a red light? (laughs) Eleven! You were counting? Eleven times have I had a green light, and I go to rollerblade, and some jackass biker almost hits me. Yeah. The cars are fine. It's the bikers. I Even almost- I noticed biking, because when, you know, when you're bike, like when I got the Mazda 3, suddenly you notice every other Mazda 3 on the road. Yep. So as soon as I'm biking, I notice all the other bikes on the road. So the well, thing Scott, is... here's the thing. You know why you're noticing all these assholes on the road? <laughs> <gasps> anyway. <laughs> no, the... Uh, Okay. So, so the thing is, right, you know, sometimes there are cars that are sort of, you know, annoying. Like, I'll be like, hey, dude, give me some room. Or like, they'll double park and it's like, great, now I can't get around you and this car is going by. And if unless I, I can't go past any further unless I go on the sidewalk. And sometimes that's annoying. Dude, you haven't driven in the Bronx enough. But, you know, and sometimes a car will like get behind me and be like, beep, beep, and be like, hey, hey you know. And it's like, okay, whatever. And, you know, I can, you know, sort of understand, even though it's a little bleh. But the bikes are just like, whatever, woo. I see even like old men just running the red line. You know, the bikes are way worse than the cars. And I'm on the bike saying this, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I want a bike, but I almost don't want to be associated with all those other bikers. Then be like me. Stop at the fucking red lights. You know, don't freaking, you know, ring your little horn at everybody. (laughs) We'll see. The thing is, I don't know how much, like, it. I don't know if it'll be that much faster to bike just because it's so short as it is. And the primary thing slowing me down even rollerblading is red lights. No, the thing is, it's way fast on the bike. Like, you go over that bridge and it's just like, like, I'm like, even when I'm pedaling up the hill on the bridge going, eh, eh, right? And I, I like, I look at the little fence that prevents you from falling off the bridge and I watch how fast the fence is going by. It's like fence, post, fence, post, fence, post, fence, post, fence, post. And it's like, wow, if I was walking, it'd be like fence, post, <laughs> fence, post, you know? So it's like, wow, even just pedaling really go- and struggling in a low gear up a hill on this bridge is significantly faster than pretty much, you know, uh, anything but What driving. amazes me is how many people and the thing I is see even with dry- nice bikes who end up, they walk their bikes up that little tiny hill. I see some people walking it up. I see some people using the wrong gear. But the thing is, it's like, it's always like, you know, there is no like stereotype of bicycling. Like, You'll see people who like you, like if you saw them just walking around the street in normal clothes, you might think, oh, that person, you know, they don't know. No, they're like going way faster than me, some old lady. Well, uh, with bicycles in particular, I think everyone knows how to ride a bike. And New York is just a place where that skill is actually useful. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people ride bikes just because it's useful and everyone learns Mm -hmm. how to ride a bike when they're Mm -hmm. a kid. Except Greg. <laughs> <laughs> so on Sunday, is a non sequitur. Oh, that's uh, great. On Sunday. You know, I'm, you can't make something a sequitur by simply declaring that it was a non sequitur. Yes, you can. 
So on Sunday, I made some uh, Nueva Cochina. I really oh, like that it, stuff. It was so tasty. I like it too. So then, uh, you know, on Monday, it just sat in the fridge. And on yet last night, I ate it again. But you didn't want to come and help me eat it, even though I had so much left I over. I did want to come and help you eat it, but I had uh, other important things to do. Uh-huh. I was editing uh, YouTube videos. You know, the Geek Nights YouTube stream is going to come online at some point. You sure you weren't dicking around? I was also playing mm. DDR because I got it set up again. <laughs> it does, the fifth D. <laughs> Initial D, that's six Ds. You know what? You know what? I got to save this for Tuesday. I'm not going to talk about DDR. I'll say one thing. I fucking miss playing that shit. DDR is the best. Oh my god, Wildwood doesn't do it for me because it's not so, the memory. In Wildwood, it's so the loud. Dancing. It's so like you can't hear the music, and everyone sucks. And I kind of forgot how great it is to just have the loud music. Were you using Stepmania? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. And you know what? I downloaded some uh, torrent of every Stepmania song ever. Me too. It has DDR, first mix, second mix, third mix, fifth mix, sixth. What the fuck? We got the same torrent. Where the hell is? It the had a fourth mix folder that was empty, right? It actually it was full, but there were no arrows in there. Just MP3s. Oh, really? The one I got was all arrows and no MP3s. Huh. But I did get this Konami official folder. I downloaded that. I didn't the, look in it yet. The Konami official folder that came in the same torrent as the, as the everything else had a bunch of fourth mix in it because it was like night in motion and shit. So in I had there. this weird problem and where you. So get this. The, I, I started to play and I was sucking like bad. And I'm thinking, I'm hurt. I'm hurt real bad. What's going on? Do I suck at DDR now? Are you a monkey? Is it the... Uh, <laughs> I actually downloaded that announcer pack. Me too. I found it. I also got that. That's the best one. But I, I need to get Alice character pack and also Baldo character pack. I was doing so bad. And then I thought, wait a minute. And I turned on the auto sync for one song, which let it, it'll, it'll look at how you're dancing. And then it'll use the statistical deviation of your steps based on whether, like when you hit close, but you're off by a couple milliseconds mm -hmm. to figure out how offset the arrows are from the music. Mm. And it off, it changed everything by 0.119 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then everything was great. Mm. But then I thought, wait a minute. Maybe I just calibrated this now differently from every DDR machine. I'm going to screw myself in the long run. Mm. So I started calibrating like every song. I went through 15 songs. I was within 0.03 milliseconds deviation on all of them. Mm. So there is a delay in the Mac going to the HDTV. Oh, oh. <laughs> that is where the delay is. Okay. I was like, what? <laughs> but I felt very precise in my dancing that I was, that I am within 0 0.003 milliseconds, not milliseconds, seconds of perfect timing. But anyway, getting back to my point is I, last night I ate some leftover Nuevo Cochina and there's even more leftover. Oh my God. Are you going to eat it again tonight? No. No? Uh, maybe tomorrow. But the, uh, Will it keep that long? Yeah, why not? I'm microwaving it, so if there's any nasty thing in there, it's getting hosed. Uh, unless it already made its poison. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but um, I uh, so I ate two burritos last night, <laughs> and my stomach was so gurgly. It's even gurgling now. It's That's like, great. It's the ultimate gurgle. So anime, <laughs> comics, all that stuff. Hi, everybody. You heard, uh, heard about us from Anime Boston. Saw our panels. Saw the uh, link to the slideshow that you all asked about. It's online. Uh, all I want to say is we're not talking about Anime Boston tonight. We're going to talk about Mocha first. So, I don't know. Anime Boston, there's not a lot to say. We recorded a show already, but we're not going to upload it just yet. Uh, all right. It was a convention of anime. Yep. We did some panels. We, they seemed uh, to go over well. We went to some panels. We, we walked around the dealer's room once. We walked around the artist alley a couple times. Daryl Surratt was, as always, incredibly impressive with his mad array of mad panels. What's man? And uh, we saw we hung out with people, and I don't know. I'm sorry, guys. Anime Boston was fun and all, but the week being it being the weekend after PAX, just it's really hard. It's like riding the biggest roller coaster in the world, and then riding the kitty coaster like five times in a row. It doesn't matter how many times you ride it; it just can't compare. Yeah, so it's like if you ride the big roller coaster, woo, and then you ride the kitty coaster, and you're basically taking a nap on it. You know, if I'd gone to Anime Boston the weekend before PAX, it would have been great. That's what they should have done. Um, well, they there's I don't think there was anyone who had a chance to change that situation. <laughs> uh, Anime Boston could have just scheduled uh, two weeks earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but when did PAX actually schedule? And when did, remember when they announced when, where PAX East was going to be? It doesn't matter. It was too late to get the Sheraton, so actually Hopefully PAX... they just, they, they, they won't be the same weekend, because that'll be the end of Anime Boston. Yeah, at least for us. Yeah. Oh, also, uh, got any anime, manga, comic, uh, media news? I do indeed. You know, at the MoCA, I was noticing that, you know, the, you know, 
Fanographic started doing the Yoshihiro Tatsumi stuff, but the Gekiga action, see, you know, in the the you know the indie underground comics of Japan, they're starting to bubble up even more. In the indie comics, publishers of the U.S. are picking them up, you know, and it's not just Fanographics, but others like Top Shelf and such. And it's pretty interesting. It must have been a success for you know uh, Fanographics if other people are following suit. But anyway. Uh, Top Shelf is going to publish a 400-page compilation of stories from a you know underground uh, anthology of manga from Japan called AX. The guy who's in charge of AX, named Akino Kondo, is going to come to New York City on April 21st. To... Next weekend. Is it really next weekend? I think so. Oh, shit. Yeah, next weekend. No, it's next Wednesday. It's a week from today. Oh, crap. Yeah. Whoa, yeah, Wednesday. Yeah. Uh... Uh, and the thing is, he's doing it at this exhibit that's going on, and the exhibit is a showcase of all 120 issues of Garo, which is like the original real deal Gekiga magazine that you know Tatsumi and others worked on. So not only do I get to go hear this like you know modern underground manga dude talk, but I also get to see every issue of Garo ever in this museum exhibit. So it's going to be totally sweet. What's even worse, there's an opening reception that we could go to, but it's already happened from 6 to 8 p.m. today. Yeah, no, I, I didn't I knew about that a while ago, but I didn't want what's I didn't want to go to it, you know. It looks like a, it's interesting looking at the picture of them it's talking never, about it's it. It's never a good idea like, you know, I mean, people like to go to like openings, gallery openings, or exhibit openings. Gallery openings are great. Here's why: one, free wine; two, free cheese and crackers. Right. The thing is, if you act, you know, that's fine if you want wine, cheese, and crackers, which I do. But if you just that's how I survived RIT. If you actually want to see the exhibit, going to the opening is actually pretty bad because that's the time it is the most crowded. There's the most people in your way. It, it's tough though because it's at the always, same time, I at, like to at, go at a time like when no one else is there, so you can just totally take your time. At the same time, you're empty. underestimating the factor of the fact that most of the people who go to the openings of these things are going primarily to hobnob with the other people there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is I'm saying, you know... As opposed to look at the art. So the few times I've gone to a gallery opening, like that was a big deal, most of the people there were kind of standing in the middle talking, drinking the wine, eating the cheese, and I just went and looked at all the art with no one in my way. Possible, depending on the size and shape of the uh, the gallery, but... Well, yes, I mean, if it's... I don't know what shape would be bad, maybe a hexagon... (laughs) So, that it? Yeah, that's it. That's all you got? Yeah. I don't have too much. I'm watching uh, Votom slowly. I got to get some DVDs from Scott. I started I watching uh, Yamato, oh, but I think I'm going to hold oh, off. Oh, you're on, actually watching the Yamato. I'm going to hold off on the Yamato because I got to watch all of Votoms first so we can actually review it. Mm-hmm. I think it's actually worth yeah, reviewing. I've watched both, so you can pick whichever one and we can review. I'll watch Votoms first. I gotta, I it takes watch, a lot longer to watch Votoms. Yeah, but I'll power through it. <laughs> and uh, I'm almost caught up on Dura, which is fucking awesome. You know, the last episode of Dura, I think, I, I don't know if there's a new one on Crunchyroll yet, but the last one I watched, right, I think it was episode 12 or 13, it seemed like the end of the show. It's like, oh, the show's over. And then I went and apparently I talked to, you know, some friends of ours who also watched all the episodes that were up there. And they're like, no, this is like tw- 24 episodes total. That's like the halfway climax. I was like, what? You'll get to an episode and you'll be like, oh, that's the ending right there. And it's not the ending. It's like, oh, shit. But uh, my prediction in Dora that I predicted way early was absolutely correct. So the show is not so good at being like, you know, uh, keeping its mysteries mysterious, but it is still pretty good at being entertaining and awesome. So, you know. So things of the day. I made a critical fatal error recently, and now's the time to correct it. I, well, I go to College Humor. That's where I steal most of my thing of the day videos, as many of you smart people may have been able to figure out. Let's, but, not li- let's link to like the YouTube version of this video instead of I feel of like the... we should link to the College Humor. <laughs> oh, you, nah. <laughs> well, I, I make the post, so guess what? But regardless, now normally I pride myself in my internet filter. I mean, you know, we'll, Scott and I will be sitting there. We'll have friends over. We'll be going through the College Humor or some other site looking at funny videos. And Scott and I usually, we look through and we pinpoint like, that one will be funny, that one's not worth watching, that one will be funny, that one's not worth watching. We kind of filter. We're always on the same page. And all the kind of inexperienced people will sit there and be like, ah, what about that one, cute dog, blah, 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 that looks good, but they're never good. Yep. Well, uh, my filter, for the first time in my life, 
has failed me. Well, I, to your credit, right, and you know, to the credit of our filters, right, it wasn't a situation of a false positive where you said, "Oh, this will be good," and it sucked. It was a situation of you said, "Oh, that sucked," and it was good. So my filter filters out pretty much all the plankton. It is, so yeah, it is so a, as long as you get, as long as you don't watch any bad things. If you miss some good things, it's okay because good things come around again, especially from the vault or whatever. Whereas if you, you know, you just want to avoid wasting time on bad things and you're all set. So, uh, Gary Oak. I'm Gary Oak. With my cribby crabbies. <laughs> uh, this is just fucking hilarious. Fuck, Misty. There's nothing else to say about it, pedophile. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, okay, so my thing of the day here is totally awesome. It is, well, A is for, uh, <laughs> Aztecs, What's A for? Aztecs in atomic armor attacking anomalous amphibians. <laughs> so what this is here, it's, I guess it's Unreality Magazine, which I've never heard of before, but they've got a post here, and the post is the most badass alphabet ever, and it looks like they got a different artist to do each letter of the alphabet in some nerdy fashion, uh, with alliteration. And, you know, and it, so there's an illustration and an alliteration in nerd fashion for every single letter of the alphabet by a different artist. So I saw one of these before. I didn't realize it was the thing. I just saw W, like link so somewhere. For, so for P, it's like Peter Parker playing ping pong with Pikachu. And there's a hilarious picture. And for K, their K is for Kiss King Kong. And it's King Kong throwing up the horns with some kiss makeup. I don't know. I think my personal favorite is still Q is for Q and Q reading Q, just because it has a recursion. The recursion does add a lot to that one. You know, it's the classic picture of your cubicle, but in the picture is the picture of the cubicle. I like the art the best on the Tintin one, because it actually looks like Tintin art. It's Tintin and a Time Lord taking tea in Tibet. But uh, if I had to pick a favorite one... I don't know, that evolving emu is pretty funny, just for the way it's, it's kind of laughing. Yeah, it's pretty good. A little bit of Psyduck with a little bit of Howard the Duck? Yeah, I don't know, picking a favorite. Like, none of them, like, they're all pretty awesome, but I, don't, I can't find one that's, like, the awesomest, like, way up above the other ones. I guess this Optimus Prime obliterating Oompa Loompas is pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, whatever. This is a totally awesome nerdy alphabet, and if you want to see Galactus geeking out with his glove puppets of Gundam and Godzilla, you should go to this website. But all that aside, we kind of talked about a lot of non-Mocha, so I suppose we should just talk about the Mocha, or at least the art festival, not the museum that we've never really talked about. Well, it's saying art festival is redundant, because the last A in Mocha is art, so it's like if you say art, Mocha Art Festival, you're actually saying... Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art but Art if I Festival. Say just, mocha Fest. If I say just Mocha Festival, it might be about coffee. No, the Mocha Festival is definitely the correct uh, way to say it. But does not not also refer to coffee or perhaps no, chocolate? Sir, no, sir, you it just doesn't. have to stress the two there C's. Isn't, there isn't a Mocha Festival with an H in it. It doesn't exist. Maybe we should pronounce one of the C's different like. Uh, no. Or draw Mo-ha-ha. anyway. So you might have noticed, much like before, when we had uh, guest host Conrad Kralin. Why on do you the keep show, insisting on this guest host business? To talk about cell phones. We have it yet again. We're going to try to make this a trend, at least for a while. We have the right honorable Emily Compton. Because it's so rare that I'm in this room with you guys. She's usually the studio audience. She's been a guest in the past, a guest host in the past. Well, see, uh, <laughs> look, see, even you, you're failing. It's not a guest host unless they are hosting. <laughs> just give up on it. Just like you give up on your stupid guess that's pride and all that other stupid shit you keep doing. My hilarious shticks? Yeah, your non-hilarious, your repetitive, annoying shticks. Your shticks that you shticks. do to make Scott angry. Well, nobody likes them. <laughs> nobody. It's thing. not me. It's Nobody likes these shticks. Uh, I will point out out that for everyone other than you, that's pride. It's not a shtick. That's a one-off joke that's hilarious. No, no, I see it every time and I'm like, it's coming. Because He's you guys going know to it's say coming. it. He's you know going to say When I was at Anime Boston, guy sitting to my left, he did not see it coming. When I said, I guess that's pride, he laughed. You know, you know what? what? From now on, every time you do that, I'm going to be like, oh, I guess you're Greg Hartman. And you, and you know, know what? what? No one else is going to know what that means. And you know it doesn't what? matter. You'll know what it means. Guess it should make what? you you'll feel bad mm-hmm. and you should feel bad. There was this chart about dweebs and geeks and nerds and stuff like that. And one of the things for being a dweeb was that you'd go around repeating the same joke over and over to oh, different people. So you are but, a dweeb. Uh, I point out, is that not also what someone like George Carlin does? He tells the same joke. But he's at up front shows. about it and you can see it and it's like yeah. a record. He it's not wrote like, the joke. Yeah. He's he's not pretending he's being like 
original every time. It's it's like, yeah, this is like a, it's a, a performance play that art. I wrote. Yes. Yeah. But it's not like old Jews telling jokes. It's not any telling of a joke or performance. So what if you happen to tell the same joke multiple times in the course of your life? Well, I guess you're part of it is you're pretending when you tell the joke, it's like a one off performance. Like, I am performing just for you, and this is an original joke I thought up because I am so witty. But actually, it's also it your joke. <laughs> I think it's simpler than that. Your joke isn't funny. I think it is. <laughs> George Carlin is funny every time. Maybe I think the pride you joke is funny. You are funny zero times. It wasn't funny the first time or any time thereafter. It wasn't Sometimes funny the first time when, I, when they did it on Anime Hell. I thought it was hilarious. Some not jokes are funny. very funny. Because, I mean, that thing somehow represents pride. The but point it's... is, is that we are not guest hosts unless <laughs> we are not here. It's just guest. All right. I might back, get some uh, backup arguments later. I don't some... think anyone will agree with you that someone is a guest host unless we are not here and they are taking up the duties of hosting. We'll if they're see. just on the show with us, they're only a guest and not a guest host. But if, what if they're hosting with us? If someone sits next to Letterman, those, that's not a guest host. That's a guest. We'll see. If Letterman, is, if Letterman is sick at home so, and someone's sitting at his desk, No, no, no. I, I've got a good a metaphor, host. okay? So Geek Nights is like an apartment that you guys share it's like having a guest host would be like putting somebody's name on the lease or having them sublet. Maybe but you're just inviting me in. <laughs> no. So anyway, the Mocha, the Mocha Art Festival. It the, was just awesome. the Mocha Festival. And not boiling hot like it was last year, which was uh, very, very yeah. nice. Yeah, I have to give credit to the to the people running it, right? It's like, okay, they were in the puck building. Not so good because it's cramped with the multiple rooms. And there's and a it, crazy old elevator. You go up yeah. in the creaky but, elevator. But I mean, it really wasn't, it wasn't ideal, right? Yeah. So they moved to the armory, which was, you know, cheap, right? Because they don't have a lot of monies. You know, it's mostly, this is where the Mocha Museum gets all its fundraising from is, you know, this. The armory selling uh, ammo. Right. So, you know, they had it in the armory, which is this big empty room that they do like drills in usually when it's not being used for uh, festivals. There were there were actually some on duty soldiers walking around it's, on the second it, floor. It's I an saw. armory. It's real. It's in use. There's arms there. Yeah. You know, it's the real deal. But it was funny how many people at the Mocha just had no idea that's what was going on. Like that's what the building was. They didn't what did you think that's it was? That's weird though, because it's got all these signs and it's like US Army and they've got a list of people who passed yeah, away in wars old. and it stuff looks more like, like that. It, but is it really says old. it says like Operation, you know, Iraqi Freedom and stuff on yeah. some of the It stuff. is people, really old. It's just still in use. Think about that sort of thing. They don't look at like a a building like that and just think about modern military they think of it as like a relic something old they don't they, no one really considers in their daily life that all those things are kind of real and that we do store that stuff just kind of next door in the building but mm. the thing is i mean the chrysler building's damn old but like modern day businesses are still in that how how is a military building any different well, just because people don't think about military stuff like that in their daily lives. Uh, and, I mean, most of the people we talk anyway, to Anyway, no this idea. is this is completely okay. tangential yes, and pointless. The, it, it the is point indeed. is, is that, you know, they had it, it, they moved it to this armory, but they didn't change the time of year. And the result was that the armory had really no air conditioning. It, it was, was like an A oven. zillion degrees last year. It's this big... Uh, you know, metal dome and it, it had the worst fanboy funk. But the thing is, there were no fanboys there. It was just that hot. Yep. So all credit to them because I would have tried to find another place, you know, and I wouldn't have found one because there aren't any. And all credit to the people at the uh, the Mocha for coming up with the idea of, hey, let's just move it to a different time of year in the same building when it's not a million Granted, degrees. they got really lucky because I note that the entire week up until the Mocha, it was like 80 degrees. No, yeah, it was only true. 80 degrees for like a couple days. Yeah, but yeah, it, but it was been 80 degrees that week. Unseasonably yeah, warm. I think it's pretty, it was a pretty safe uh, safe go. Plus, you know, it wasn't as warm as it was uh, for the uh, last year. True, true. Not even close. It was, you know? it was like incredibly pleasant weather that day. Yep. It was nice and brisk. It's very good. Anyway, so in terms of my policy, like every time I go to Mocha, it's kind of like I'm overwhelmed by the amount of things that I want to buy. So I figured I'm going to take out a certain amount of money. I took out $100 and I wasn't going to spend more than that, which is a sizable sum. But I also figured, you know, they have a lot of publishers there. They're indie publishers, but they're pretty big, like uh, like Top Shelf or Vertical and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And so I said to myself, if there's something I can get online, I'm not going to buy it at the festival. 
I might buy it later online, but it's like this this money is just set aside for indie comics and special things I can only get here. Yeah, well, the, you know, uh, I totally agree with that. Like, you know, it's obvious sort of logic that I would normally follow. You know, it's like, why should I buy this book from Top Shelf? It's on Amazon, you know, like buying a funny mini comic about lumberjacks. You ain't getting that anywhere <laughs> else. Right. But, you know, a book from a real publisher, you can get that anytime. The thing is, the people are there if the person's there. Right. And it's not like, you know, autographs. I don't really care so much about autographs you know but, but it's, it's like need to talk to it's the like the person's there and it's like what i'm gonna go up and talk to the person who wrote the who made the book that i like and then i'm not gonna buy it you know so it's like well you know i well, can you go do you it's like say. i could go and buy i had if i could go and buy the newest dr mcninja volume you know from you know the internets or I could go buy it from the Dr. McNinja guy who's there right now. And it's, you know, it's to pay to co either way. So what's the difference? I'm going to buy it. Definitely. All you have to do is, you know, you talk to him and be like, hey, and be like, so, you know, I already bought your book on to pay to co. But that's a lie, Rim. Mm-hmm. If we hadn't already bought the book, it would be terrible. Yeah, if you haven't already bought it. But if you pre-order everything or you get it on to pay to co. That's yeah. true. Like if you got you a know. pre-order in. But the point, if it's like the same price, it's like what? You know, who cares? Well, it's like Hope Larson's book. She uh, it's sold on Amazon and everything. But uh, it was cool to buy it directly from her and talk to her briefly. Plus admit, the, person- the main reason I bought it from her in person was that it, a lot of people were saying that it's going to sell out and there's going to have to be another print run. That's yeah. that's also uh, a quite frequent possibility. Another thing is that the person who makes it, usually when you buy it from them, at the, they get a lot more monies than, you know, if you buy it on Amazon, it's like, okay, Amazon takes a cut, the publisher, publisher takes a cut, and the, the person who wrote made it got a royalty. If you yeah. buy it from them at the convention, it's like they get a lot greater percentage of monies. I didn't realize that, actually. Well, I also have this funny feeling that several of them do not, in fact, pay the uh, duly owed uh, sales taxes. Yep, most likely, yes. You know. Maybe. I, just, I have that impression. Yeah, probably. Some of the, some of the mini comics. But actually, um, I was happy to see that the Scandinavian comics had actually expanded this year. Well, I they, think they were been more... there like three or four years in a row. Those yeah, guys. but, but they I, had uh, one table last I, year. I, I noticed, no, they had more well, than like, one table. It was like, it started with two. It started with two, it started with two, like two years ago, and then it's gradually expanded. And I think this year there were more comics than ever before. And I actually, a shout out to our friend Timo because he sent us a box of comics, which I've read most of them and you guys haven't. So nag nag, but, um, he sent this one. I don't even remember the name of it, but it's about these two girls who live in a cabin, and it's kind of funny. I like that and one, but I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea either. And I read but way it, into it. I, I still thought it was it was cute, and there was like goofy stuff going on, like somebody fart in a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I was like, you know, I saw is that, is this. That like, is that it? Well, I guess they call it a Dutch oven, right? When you fart under the blanket. <laughs> so is that like a Dutch bottle? I guess so. <laughs> but anyway, it's a portable Dutch oven. The, the point being, I recognize this comic book Dutch character on one of the uh, the Finnish comics tables postcards. And I was like, oh, I know this comic. My friend sent it to me and it's really cool. And I was talking to the lady and they were like really, really surprised I knew it. So I was I was very proud of myself. Yay. But um, proud anyway. that you coincidentally saw something. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know that I that I actually had something to talk about common knowledge with Finnish comics. That was that was part of it. I was like, yay! I knew something about Finnish comics. Now, Not the thing a lot, is the mocha, but a little. It's like if you're a comics person, any random person who's walking around, it's like, oh, yep, we all know these same things. Yeah, it was it was cool, and I talked to uh, the one of the guys from Sweden for a really long time, but I felt really bad for him because most of his books got lost by UPS in uh, international shipping. Bam. And so he, he drew like this picture of him and his friend and they were all sad because we have no books. And But he, he was also showing me this um, uh, quarterly publication that has all sorts of international comics in it that... Uh, that the Scandinavian consulates seem to be involved in. That's sad his mm-hmm. books were lost because there was another situation. Apparently, some of the people coming from Canada, they were on a bus and the bus got stopped for customs and customs almost took all their books because they wanted to get them on some import tax that they didn't Whoa, pay. Oh, no. shit. And the sad story I was told was that apparently customs like made a big deal about it and delayed the bus for like an hour and everyone was mad and this huge problem. And then they finally, like they flipped through one of the books and they looked disappointed like, oh, these aren't, 
professional, and then they gave him back and let him go. Oh, uh, that's it not... It was the saddest story I'd ever heard. That uh, is not the ending I was expecting for that. Oh, that's so sad. Uh, I, I, that was incredibly uh, heartbreaking. But, I thought it was going to end with, oh, it had porn in it or something, because actually there's a surprising amount of, like, strangely erotic comics. Not like... They're not porn, sexy, sexy. but they're, they're, they're just they're like... like Penis head they're guy all, and stuff like that in an R crumb kind of way. Exactly, that's well, a no. it, that's a wonderful way to put like it. These very like I don't even know if a lot of them are erotic. They just have not, to, they have nakedness the way like you know old art has no, nakedness. No, no, I think no. We're talking in specifically that about the weird. ones that are very very weird. Like, like there's penis, a phallus like coming around. out of the sun. Is that, is that erotic for you? A big penis? No, walking around? that's what I'm saying. I so? said it was bizarre, but it's it's like I suppose it. Since it like draws a lot of depictions of genitalia, it's it's erotic art. In the very least, there are many, many more penis related <laughs> items than there were vagina related. I don't know. Items. Personally, Thank I don't God. count. You know, just because something has a depiction of a of a phallus or something else, you know, I, in my book, that doesn't make it erotic art. I mean, is my is is da- you know is the statue of David is that erotic? It's got a penis. But what Not if the really. statue of David was using his penis to bop people over the head? <laughs> that would just be funny. <laughs> <laughs> it would indeed be really funny. My <laughs> mission to anyone out there is to have that at the moment. Uh, someone, <laughs> someone, draw a picture. Of, you know, Michael no, 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 Scott David. would totally this buy it. This has got to be a 24-hour comic. Okay. 24-hour? Well, yeah. Speaking you, of which, there gonna, were a the lot plot? of 24-hour comics at yeah. the MoCA. Well, Actually, that's, a, that's like a new hot thing to do. Is definitely. Like people go to like comic stores when they're having big sales or what. You know, whenever there's a, a, like a local comic event, yeah. they'll get some artists to show up and do a 24-hour comic at the event. And that, you know, that's like the shtick lately. But it's like I, I picked up a handful and a lot of them were written on it. It said, uh, you know, this was done as a 24 hour yep. comic. And I think there's a 24 hour comic day them. also, like the day you're supposed to do it. Yeah. And then all the artists who do it, they keep the 24 hour comic and then they sell it, you know, over and over well, again. Well, like Yuko does it and uh, yep. a handful of my art friends do it. So, yeah, it's it's like a yearly thing, but it, it also, you can do it whenever. It's like the, you know, the um, the NaNoWriMo. It's, yeah, like, it's the same kind of shtick. Yeah, you know? but less uh, intensive than the NaNoWriMo. Yeah. So, so the Mocha, I guess this year compared to last year, you know, to years previous, it was, I think there were actually, it was smaller in terms of number of tables. It I mean, definitely was. The turnout in terms of, you know, visitors seemed to be about the same, you know, but the, you know, the number of tables was less. In the back right corner, there was actually an area with all these like tall circular tables. Kind of you a could, hangout zone yeah. covered with uh, various business cards. I like that. It's like then somebody who couldn't afford a table would just put their put their business card on there I think people who had tables also put their business cards on there, you know. Yeah. But, you know, it was just, you know, they had as they always have an area where you can put flyers at the Mocha, but... You know, having it back there, it's like, well, we didn't sell enough tables to fill this space, so let's fill it with this instead. And that was, you know, it made a nice area you could just stand in and go, ah. But while the side, like, there were definitely, a, I think, fewer tables and everything, the density of awesome was such that usually I budget, like, a few hours, and I can walk through the whole thing, see everything, be good to go. Yeah, it was weird. forever, man. I didn't, like, I didn't eat breakfast. Well, I, I ate a little bit of breakfast, barely. I had a, I had a chunk of Rim's corn muffin, and, and that's that all a, I ate right? all day. Because I was expecting to, like, go to the mocha see a whole bunch of stuff, eat lunch, maybe go back for an hour and then be like, all right, whatever. And be out of there like, you know, mid afternoon. Yeah. So after two usually, hours, usually, I've made it through barely an aisle and a half. Yeah. Usually you go to the mocha, you see everything and then you've seen it all. And then you walk around again, like sort of cursorily and you know, it's I like, okay, my, my two hours of walking. And I, I was not even halfway through like all the, like all the aisles I wanted to see. I bumped into an off and I'm like, Hey, How's it going? He's like, man, it's like molasses. And the table's just pulling me in. I've been <laughs> here forever. so true. Yeah, so this year the quality was definitely way, way, way up. Yeah. Actually, it was funny. I I convinced one of my coworkers to go. And uh, he, he was... Uh, I'm not sure if he's so much an indie comic person. He doesn't know much about comic books, but he went to check it out. And he was like, there are a lot of illustrators there that were kind of cool and everything. So I was happy. I was like, maybe he'll get into it. Mm. But um, I don't see, you know, if you're a human being who enjoys any amount of arts, 
there is something for you. You know, there's no reason not to go. It's so cheap. It's like what ten bucks to get in. Yeah, fourteen bucks. Well, no, you, no, it's about four hundred dollars to get in because you're gonna have to buy all that stuff. <laughs> but uh, no, but you know the point. There's no way to avoid that. The point is, is it just it's cheap to get a badge. You know, you just go in. It's you know it takes only a few hours, and it's just like it's such a good time. If you're and, anywhere within distance, you should, there's no reason not to go unless you got something better going on. And there's just a really really wide range of both uh, skill levels, like everything from the guy who just photocopies copies his own stuff all the way up to like the glossy bound uh, hardcover books from the big publishers. But it's like, what did we see? We saw a $125 enormous full color book that oh was like God. about oh, that was, that three was, foot that was by that three anthology foot. of famous people. There's yeah, a lot it was of like Tomine and stuff like that. Yeah. A bunch of that, a bunch of artists. I there knew. There were a lot of hardcover books from very small press. I think there's suddenly a cheap way to make hardcover well, books. Well, must be because uh, Kalman, I ran into... The guy who used to run, he's like a nerdy guy who ran D&D for us freshman year of college. And he's hes very loud and kind of bossy. But he's been doing a comic with this artist from Argentina or something like that. And he mm-hmm. had a bunch of hardcover books for sale. And I know if uh, Kalman's still pretty indie, so if he could afford hardcover books, I guess it's not so much of a money drain. So things that really stood out to me... In no particular order at all. One, Diary of Diaries, the trilogy has ended. I've talked about it for three years, and I'm sad to say it has come to an end. But uh, the quote from the, I'm going to read the quote from the last page because it sums up the whole uh, epic story arc. So, in closing, let me leave you with this: When a hard wind's a blowing, take heed and realize the storm. She's a coming. (laughs) <laughs> oh dear <laughs> so, oh dear so uh, let's see what else was it oh the uh, like the SVA and the oh, the SVA the was rocking the house and the Center for Cartoon Studies so like, many there were, SVA like, there people there were so many tables of people who were from one of those two schools yeah they might have even been approaching like 25 or even Maybe a maximum like thirty five percent of the tables. Of course, there were are people from those places. Two reasons I think that this is is one SBA is really close, so it's like you yeah, know, the Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont, and they had a whole row of tables in the back. Very true, but like SBA has always been there. Like I remember oh, yeah. the first they were always there. yeah the first uh, time I went to the Mocha, they had just the one table. Like SBA, take our. A uh, free compilation of student work, and this is really cool. But it's like, you know, people who weren't necessarily affiliated with the SVA table, but were SVA students. There were a ton of folks like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, late, lately, I've just been like, oh, SVA, why are you so good? Uh, there must. I wonder, like. Maybe if, like, even someone who has no arts whatsoever goes to that school, like, they just turn you into awesome arts. Maybe nah, should, how, how much does it cost to go there? Lots of money. It's a uh, private school. Not as much as NYU, but... Not uh, as well. I mean, RIT is a private school. Is it the same as RIT? Uh, I, I actually don't know yeah. what tuition for SVA costs, but they do have really good programs. And, um... I don't know. It's it's fairly difficult to get in. I think you have to have a decent portfolio, uh, but okay. they do so, have. <laughs> so they would not let me in, even yeah, if I had I all mean, the monies if, in the world. If you're trying to get into art school, uh, in in place of an application essay, and o- often in addition to the application essay, you have to submit a portfolio, and that's that's. Even though sort I'm of like the, already a college graduate and I'm old, I'm, I'm not, I don't I'm know. Not a kid out of high school anymore. I still have to do that. You can look on the SVA website and see if you'd get accepted to <laughs> Man, one of their cartooning even know programs. What to do anymore? Going back to college, like FAFSA, got to find one of those things and fill it out. It would, it would be really? like that song from Avenue Q. Uh, <laughs> Why can't I go back to college? So. I bought this for our friend Scott Johnson. You know, he's he's a politician, like for real, and he's really into politics, independent of that. And he said, I can't come to the Mocha. I have something important that I can't skip. Rim, buy me anything that you know I would like. <laughs> and I found a guy who was selling he has series one, which I bought for Scott Johnson, of black conservative trading cards. <laughs> Got some Clarence Thomas, some Michael Steele, Alan Keyes, Condoleezza Rice. He silk screened these things. They're they're pretty high quality. Yeah, no, silk screening is really popular. I bought this really awesome silk screen motorcycle poster thing. There were only like sixty something of them, but the guy silk screened all of them by this hand. Is, this is four color silk screening too, which is not easy to do. At no. least unless you have a fancy machine. Was that from the table with the cute girl whom whose brother made pixel art? Yeah, in the back left. Yeah, yeah she was nice. Oh, yeah. the the black. Uh, no, that wasn't from there. 
No, no, the one no, I got the, was from the, the back silk left screen table. of the motorcycle. Oh, that was yeah. all like Art Deco. Yeah. That was really cool. Yeah. A, couple, a couple of people went to buy that thing because you had you showed it to them or said, "Hey, I got this thing," and they were sold out. They were like, "Ooh." Yeah, the uh, I don't want to spend like too much time just going over like the list of things that we got. No, because just, just we'll highlights. Do, really highlights. Yeah. We'll do a separate. Because uh, I got to say, this really stood out. Someone wrote a play and just had it bound for sale. But that's not it, a comic book. When I bought it, he said... There's the, a lot of stuff there. He about. said, I and know. I quote, you're the first person to even look at this. It is called Perens. And when I showed it to our friend Conrad, he said, so what, it's a play about Lisp? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the nerds laughed. Yes. And no one else did. No. But, uh, but a play. Actually, I'm, I'm excited about this. And the other non-comic that was kind of strange, Scott Bateman took a public domain horrible movie took just the audio from it, and just animated a movie using that as the audio track. And I bought the DVD. Mm-hmm. It's an hour and ten minutes long, and it says on the box, 2009, 71 minutes, color, mono, uh, aspect ratio 133, bad acting. You know, <laughs> That's I, one of the warnings. Yeah. You know what's really interesting is that last year, right, uh, Randall Monroe had, like, the big-ass line, you know? But this year, he wasn't there. You know who had the big-ass line? Kate Beaton had this gigantic line. Oh, my we God. We called it, line. it was known as the Beaton Path. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Joke stealer. You stole it from someone else. Yes. In fact, you stole it from the guy who runs the mocha, right? Yes, yes was, well, it the, was, was the, the least, guy. I think he was either the head of the mocha mocha or the head of the logistics. Uh, it was, like, the festival. He had a, he had a fancy it's badge. It said festival director. Yeah. But it was funny, because we're standing in line to see Kate Beaton, and I hear the guy behind me, you know, Scott and Emily and the rest of the crew, they're all talking. And I'm kind of half listening. And he says, well, I guess we're on the beaten path. And his friends all laughed. So I just turned to Scott and Emily and I said, well, I guess we're on the beaten path. And, and us, they all laughed. We <laughs> hadn't heard. So we were like, oh, my and then, God. And then I turned so back funny. to him and I was like, I just totally stole your joke. And he and it goes, made all them laugh. And then they laughed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was a good joke. And I she drew a pirate it, for you. Yeah. I should have told it to Kate Beaton. Yeah, it was still it was really interesting to see that she had this gigantic line. I mean, she was there last year, but we didn't see her like we showed up and we noticed, oh, this is her table. And she wasn't there at the time and we never tried to see her again. But it was just like, wow, that, you know, it's like I knew that, you know, she's pretty popular and her stuff is high quality. But I didn't realize she was that popular. I know, you know right? That that were that many, you know, like more so like Dr. Meninja dude is sitting there and he's got like a person coming up to him every, you know, few seconds or whatever. But he doesn't have a line, you know, wonder marks in between Kate Beaton and Dr. Meninja guy. What's it, what's Dr. Meninja guy's name? Chris Hastings, I think. Yeah, that sounds yeah. right. And, you know, so Dave Malky's the Wonder Mark guy. He's got people coming up once in a while, just chilling, doing his thing. He's there every year, right? We discovered him because of the mocha, in fact, you know? And he's got someone coming up every once in a while. And then Kate Beaton is there with his mob. Yeah. It's like, really? Which is kind of awesome because you figure only a couple years ago, she started out on LiveJournal and it was one of those instances where there was no real self-promotion or anything. It's just kind of got mimetically traded around and everybody's like, oh my God, you got to check these comics out. They're hilarious. I think it's the same phenomenon as XKCD, right? It's like... You know, your art, which kind of art style you don't have, you know, have or don't have, it doesn't really matter as long as it's, you know, it's good and your writing is really what is the winner the on the writing internet. Is well, it was fantastic. something different, Not you know? that, you know, her art is amazing, That's you know, but that's besides well, the, the, the point. Art, it's like the style of the art really complements the kinds of jokes I mean, she makes. It's a googly know, eyes. But, I mean, kind of, yeah. pony. but it's like, look, you know, like the Penny Arcade art style can do just as well as the Kate Beaton art style. It does You can do any style as long as your style, you know, the stick figure art style of XKCD. Any style is good on the internet as long as... You know, you do it well, and your writing has to be there, you know? Well, it has to differentiate of, itself from the pack. I but, think that's the I mean, there are the plenty of webcomics out there, though, that have, like, amazing, like, holy shit arts. Like, they look like art books, but no one reads them, and they don't have big lines at the conventions because the writing is not, you know, world-changing, you know, as it is with the three comics I've just mentioned and others. So... One of the tables I spent the most money at was uh, Lucy Measley's table. I think that's how you say your name. But uh, actually, way back at the first mocha I went to, I bought this funny little comic where a girl was talking to an apple and a snowman and a refrigerator, I think. Oh, yeah, I like that one. And it was really quirky and cute, and I really liked the style. And then the next year, I saw her again, and I was like, oh, yeah, I bought your comic. And I bought, she had a CD of ukulele songs, and they were... They were really cute and happy, and sometimes I would listen to them while I was doing chores and stuff. And so it was weird because pre-MOCA, uh, Rim and Scott and I had gone to see the RIT hockey game at a sports bar. It was like an RIT alumni uh, event. Uh, and the car, I know, it was so <laughs> sad. 
but the comic store was right next door and so I was like come on guys before we go to the subway let's go comics and they were all like no but they were doing some sort of event there it was like a woman in comics event um, and she was there I was like oh I remember you from the mocha are you going to be there and then I ran into her again at drink and draw like a lady and then again at the mocha so I was like oh I've got, totally got to buy your books so um, I got two I got one that was a collection of all her old like journal comics and stuff called radiator days and that one was really good there was like a very wide range of subject matter and styles in it and it was it was kind of a bummer though because it was something i would totally give to my mom except that there were like three pages of porn right smack dab in the middle of the book so it's like uh, it's like a Shiro situation well not really it was like they were all individual stories it's just one or two of the stories happened to be rated x you know Mm. and so it was like i'd give this to all sorts of people but there's a little bit of porn in how about that so you have to be uh, okay with that that. sci-fi yaoi oh i'm I'm, haven't read it yet you know i picked up a card from it but (laughs) i was like sci-fi plus yaoi maybe this will be a good webcomic but the art looked (laughs) the art looked very good Mm. so i was like if if i am going to read a yaoi that looked like the kind of yaoi that would be interesting to me because it looked like a sci-fi story with plot and Mm. good art so Mm. i was like hey well, might I'm be not, good. I'm not, you know, if it was just sci-fi, I would read it. <laughs> why Why does Yaoi stop you from reading it, Scott? Why would I want to read Yaoi? But, but what, what if, if it's, it's a, a really good story? What if it's, okay, what if it's not Yaoi? Isn't like, definition nope. definition I know, yaoi I, was, I was going there. I was, I was going and explaining, <laughs> but uh, say it's not Yaoi. Say it's it's a homoerotic sci-fi story. Would would you not read it? It's, isn't that sanctuary? With your <laughs> that's not and a mind. sci-fi story. <laughs> but yes, know. yes, sanctuary Political is incredibly homoerotic. Plus, it's definitely a work of fiction because politi- <laughs> politics is never that awesome. I don't think political science fiction and yeah, science is not fiction. that fun. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, the, but uh, I, I might give that a look and see yeah. uh, see how good it is. So you know what was interesting is I just realized you know what was missing something that we've been checking out at the Mocha for like two or three years in a row. That dude who did the story about like the Chinese dude and the oh yeah the and one did, that used poser that one no, and then the year yep, at, same guy that yeah guy. last yeah. year he did the the one with the animals you know that escaped from like the circus or whatever yeah I didn't see him yeah he yeah. wasn't there and uh, also the cute vegetables guy the wasn't cute vegetables there guy wasn't there either his comic was great yeah I love that because it was actual cooking stuff yeah but the um. What was interesting, though, is that Lamar Abrams, right, the remake guy, who did, which is pretty much Astro Boy the Jerk. Yes. I love right? remake. So, <laughs> I that was like that. the sleeper hit. Like, so, every, yeah. like, everyone cool loves it. No one else knows about it. Yeah, so he wasn't, like, I didn't see his, he didn't have a table, or if he did, I didn't see it. But then when we finally got to the front of the beaten path, Kate Beat, you know, he comes up, and Kate Beaton's like, oh, you should check out this guy's work. I'm like, oh, you mean Lamar Abrams' work? You know, <laughs> and it's like, you know, and Rim has a little remake pin, like, on his little, uh, you know. I showed him, he's like, that's my pin! Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like we know who this guy is. You don't have to tell us what's what's going on. Yeah, we got to talk. Yeah, to him. shut up, Kate Beaton. We <laughs> yeah. know, we know. Yeah, who, do you, think, who do you think we are? You don't know us. <laughs> you don't know us. All right. There was also draw a pirate. That's right. Do what I say. There were, there were also a number of tables with really really cheap comics. Like um, there was one, and he was just like. Buy a comic, and we're like, ah, oh, we're looking, we're looking. He's like, it's fifty cents. Put it in Mister T's head. Yeah, they had and a he big, had a bank. They had a big plastic, mo- you know, bust of Mister T, his head, and you would put quarters in his top of his head, and you could take any comic for these fifty cents. And the it's art like, how could you say enough. no, even if the comic is bad? I know, and it was just fifty cents. You get a pretty decent mini comic. I got one called Crazy Lady. You, that was a good one. I yeah. read that. It was really it's good. Really yeah. good. It's the just one I got was Kick Ass Jews, not nearly as good. Really, I didn't. I the title made you choose it though. Yeah, of course. you had to get yep. that one. But yeah. Crazy Lady was actually pretty damn good. Yeah, it's just basically the story about you know the the strange people that populate a neighborhood and this guy observing this lady who always waits at the bus stop. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was also Baba Luba. That was a good one too. (laughs) Little little tiny mini comic, like tiny in size about uh, this. It's it's based on this lady's Russian grandma and she's very foul mouthed. It's like, she reprimands pussies and tulips. And no bad catch. I bought a couple of those little things, like a board angel. It's just a board angel for a few pages. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're just tiny, tiny comics with no real plot. It's just 
you know, funny little pictures. Or lumberjacks, which came with a felt beard yeah. in it. It's always funny how, like, the prices can, like, vary between tables. Like, there's no, like, standard price for a mini comic, And it's almost like... You know, you'll see something like way awesome. Like I bought this one way awesome thing called Hobby, and it just the art style of it is like totally sweet. But it's it you know it's a it's a relatively mini comic. It's not the ultra mini. It's just sort of like you know the digest dish size, and it's only like ten or so pages. But it's full color on this really hard paper, and the guy was like seven bucks, and I was like, ah, oh, really? But I bought it anyway. But you know, it's like the other dude has like fifty cents for this. You know more. You know. For crazy lady, it's like, come on. But those are the things I really look for because the stuff that like someone hand bound themselves and stapled together and like they clearly printed it at a Kinko's equivalent. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the stuff you're never gonna find anywhere else except at the Mocha. Nope. Yeah, that's so as exciting. And um I I have to mention here's another one, which the art wasn't all that great, but for the price, it got us like a great amount of laughs which was like poor poor angsty hungarian <laughs> and the poor poor angsty hungarian was this story about this prince who gets chased out of the castle it, it, there's basically it was just random and it was weird and it would be like and that's why there's whales in lake ontario and and but it's there like aren't. i know that's <laughs> the whole point it was just random shit would happen and there was like the hungarian prince and the Mon- Moldovian prince and they go around and I'm have the Moldovian these prince. are you yeah oh no then you <laughs> should be vegetarian be <laughs> you you needed to have soy and and stuff like. anyway <laughs> it was just weird and just completely batshit random and so Nuri and I were reading this I was like he he you know I bought this you have to read it Nuri and she starts reading it and flip it and then she starts laughing and laughing and so i think for the price paid that was that was well worth the money it's definitely you know you you go around you look at these indie comics and you're like you know these are not like the professional high quality amazing entertainment package that you would get you know from pretty much anything that's actually in a comic book store right but in terms of like the price per entertainment like the value you know, of what you're getting is like so much higher, you know, for like 50 cents, you can get something like crazy lady, you know, or for a couple dollars, you can get like, you know, friggin' lumberjacks or actually that one fun- little mini- funky beard, that one 24 hour comic I bought Catan the spider, which was actually, I think that one of my favorite really things neat. from the yeah. Mocha. I mm. kind of agree with you because it was, it was very different and the art was very sketchy, but actually what it portrayed was very imaginative. And I liked little dragons too, so <laughs> I suppose I was swayed by that. And little dentists, right. little dentists, little. So are we gonna? Are we? Are we? Are we pretty much gonna wrap this up? I think we should I wrap this up. So, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll cut from here to a various cavalcade of interviews and audio from the Mocha floor. And at some point in the near-ish future, we'll try to get up a video of the kind of unboxing and reviewing. Of yeah, all the we'll stuff do we some bought. sort of Scott's box-ish kind of. Like Mocha edition, where we display the the hall H A U L of what all the stuff that we got. The hall from the hall. The Mocha hall. Yay! I'm Stephen Vratos. I work for Fanfare Ponent Mon Publishing. Uh, much like Japan, which is one of our better selling books, which uh, is a short story collection, seventeen creators talking about their views on Japan. Korea will be coming out. We'll probably have advanced copy of San Diego Comic Con. And it's 12 different creators on their perception of Korea. And um, it's a really wonderful book. All right, cool. And you know that... Uh, also take that because we're really proud of it. We're pretty happy. Fanfare, Fanfare has seven, seven nominations for Eisners this season, so... Yeah, you know... And part of like being like, why can't this the comic I buy look like that instead? You know, <laughs> part of being the artist too is like you gotta you learn each time you get your thing printed, but you gotta learn what works and what doesn't, what reproduces well and what doesn't. You know, as an artist, I get really into like some of the dry brush, but some of the more subtle dry brushing doesn't show up very well. So you still have to have your your pretty bold areas of dark and light, and. Uh, you learn you learn what works and what doesn't. Yeah, that's part. That's just part of being a comic artist. Because you're not you're not doing it to sh- display the originals. You're doing it to be reproduced. Yeah, so it's just part of you part of make the deal. HD comics. Yeah. just look like that. Well, maybe for web comics you can do. You know, I guess you could. Yeah. More, uh, but even then, it's like people's screens. Like you know, some people's screens can't display all the colors, or they don't have the height. Yeah. A lot of it is just basic design too. Okay. Basically. Don't worry. This is for conversation. 
A lot of it is just basic design too, because even even if you have the highest resolution image you could possibly do, it doesn't really matter. Your eye can only take so much. Your eye wants to have areas to rest and wants areas to, to for it to be led. So um, if everything's as crazy detailed, but it's all the same tone, it's just not going to work. You need these areas of simplification, even if it's an incredibly high resolution and high detail piece. So you always have to keep that in mind, especially in comic pages, because so much is going on in individual panels. You still have to think of it as a full thing. I guess so, the answer yeah. is replicator. It's just more <laughs> added by Adam copy. Sell larger, you know, if it does well enough, eventually just sell the like. Here's the ultra edition, like the Hellboy stuff, and those big grind. Yeah, I, but the thing is though, like I love the small format. I really do like, I really do like small books. I've always liked it. It's so much more convenient. A lot, a lot of old comic guys, you know, or old, you know, traditional comic fans miss that bigger or even the really bigger formats. You know, like Alex Ross did those really big, you know, those big uh, superhero comics, and I was like, uh, and they look good. They look good, obviously, for painting like that, but they're so inconvenient. I, I just would rather have a little book, you know, read on the subway or whatever. For me, it's just I want them to fit on my shelf. That's you. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you got to oh. tell me about this. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about this movie. Uh, the movie is called Adam Age Vampire. I took the sound from a really old uh, science fiction movie, also called Adam Age Vampire. It's very bad. Took the sound and uh, animated a new movie to it. Well, hopefully there will be no more poop. Yes, that's that's the hopes and the dreams of my. No, I wanted to do it. Th I wanted it to be a trilogy from the beginning. Yeah, you're a regular George Lucas. Yeah, I'm a regular George Lucas. <laughs> uh, my name is Allison Braun, and my comic is Psychoanalytic, and it's a photo collage comic, and it's uh, not your typical photo collage because uh, I did a lot of printmaking and all the backgrounds, and um, basically what it is is. I had a journal for like uh, the last, I don't know, 10 years, and I decided to make it into a comic, and the journal is basically just me ranting, which um, basically the, the girl is trying, the girl in the comic is trying to just find her path and figure out her place in the world. And that's, that's pretty much what it's about. So my name is Ross Wood Studler. Uh, my new comic book is The Raven and the Crayfish, and uh, it was inspired by Native American legends about Crater Lake National about Crater Lake National Park, the area, and uh, a um, monstrous crayfish that who was guardian of the lake, and it's an original tale featuring what happens when the mischievous raven tries to claim the lake and has to reckon with the crayfish. And you can find more of my work at rosswoodstudler.blogspot.com. Studler is spelled S-T-U-D-L-A-R. Yeah, my name is Matthew Lux, and I am the uh, artist and writer for the Oni Press uh, series of All Ages books, Saltwater Taffy, um, which uh, three volumes are available right now. It's uh, generally a story about two brothers that are on a summer long vacation uh, in a mysterious uh, seaside town in Maine called Chowder Bay and it's about all the adventures they get into involving this, this really interesting folklore including sea monsters, uh, treasure hunts and ghost stories and a lot of just uh, quirky characters that they run into in these uh, mysteries and adventures and it's a really fun series to read and it's a fun series to uh, work on. So who should read Saltwater Taffy? Well, I think everyone should read it because uh, when I say they're all ages, it really, uh, I really did write it so that really anyone can enjoy the adventure. I would say it probably starts at like age eight and go and up, uh, but but I think that anyone can get something out of it definitely. Because I was just like I was in a sailor mood and uh, I was like looking for anything else like it. And so I'm did you watch everything that the blockbuster had, including the bad stuff like Armageddon and Doom Megalopolis? Oh uh, no, no, I saw Doom Megalopolis on TV once though. I had like a weird <laughs> antenna channel and it just came in and I saw. I think there was a scene where the guy was like cutting up fish or something like that. I was like 13 years old and I was like, what's happening? This is not like sailor mood. <laughs> So it was it was kind of shocking, but and then I that's actually how I got started reading comics too is because I love Beautiful Dreamer so much. I went to the comic book store. I was like, find this for me, and they happen to have um, 
they were calling it like Return of Mom or something. That's when they were coming out in the monthly issues. And I went in every month and I would just pick it up. And I was like, I don't know who half these people are. They're not in the movie. I was like, why is she calling me? That's weird. But it was just, it was all downhill from there. And so when I saw that shirt at Uniqlo, I was like, yes, this right here. Like, Mom was my screen name on AOL back in like 95 or something like that. So. So tell me a little bit about your comic book. Oh, sure, sure. I do a comic called Winters in Lavelle. It's a fantasy adventure book uh, for uh, young adults. Uh, I actually do it as a webcomic twice a week online. Um, it's it's about like a, a brother and a sister who get stuck in a, another world. It's like kind of like Narnia but with teenagers. So you get like a lot of like teenage fighting and stuff like that too. So, um, but it's it's I'm trying to do the kind of stuff that I liked when I was a teenager. Um, like I loved like Magic Knight Ray Earth and stuff like that. So that's that's what I'm going for. It's like I want to do that again. So what character did you watch the dub or the sub with oh, the? No 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 subtitles all the way. But you remember how they did the openers in English with oh. Sandy Fox. Yeah, I remember that. No, I'd actually been watching it at my anime club at that point, so I was like old school. Um, and that was how I got into it. I was like the only person there who was in the target demographic for Ray Earth. I was like 13 or 14, and I was like, oh my god! And uh, everybody else there was like a, like older dudes who like sci-fi stuff, but like thinking back on it, I think they just showed it for me. They were like, all right, she sits through Gundam, let's throw her a bone. <laughs> so, and then it just like, it just kind of made me want to do my own comics from that so it was like things like that that really are um, kind of what got me started oh sure sure my name is Casey Van Heis uh, my webcomic is Winters in Lavelle it's wintersinlavelle.com this is uh, Patrick McQuaid uh, the artist of Shapes the New Brethren Steve Solis the namer of Shapes the New Brethren so what's going on here? What does what this you guys do? Well, what started in high school chemistry class back in the fall of 1994 has uh, evolved to the New Brethren. Uh, we did about 400 shapes in high school. And what happens is Steve, uh, you know, on the back of ditto paper or whatever, would draw a bunch of abstract shapes. And then he would pass them off to me, and I would create a character, you know, inside or inspired by that shape. Then I would pass it back to Steve, and he would give that character a name. So again, we did about 400 in high school, and it kind of stopped. And then in 2005, we reconnected via email and, and via the postage, postal service. And, you know, we did a whole new, a new, uh, new batch. And then... Uh, Oh, sure. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then uh, the new brethren, in the last six months, we've done 34 new characters. And... Um, yeah, they are the new brethren, and uh, we have characters like Ramberger, the Chancellor, uh, Stag Willie, and the Franian Man, and uh, the book is kind of like a whole shows the whole history and evolution of the process and documents the whole uh, the whole uh, you know the whole deal. So uh, yeah, that's it. I discovered my passion for cartooning uh, right after 9/11. Um, as a turban and a bearded man. Um, a lot of people know, didn't know who Six are, so I was really a target of a lot of hate crimes. But one thing that inspired me is uh, a couple of cartoonists who actually um, uh, sketched Six into their cartoons, showing them as victims of hate crimes. And I said, hey, that's interesting. Maybe, uh, you know, there should be more cartoons about Six. So that's how it got started, and that was almost eight years ago, and I uh, came up with the idea of Sick Tunes, cartoon Sick Tunes. And I basically take news items from around the world, relating to six and create a single usually single panel cartoons uh, so a lot of the stuff you see here is from the last eight years this piece uh, the I call this the American Turban Chronicles uh, collection and it's kind of like my experience and a lot of other people who wear turbans with a lot of it comes from ignorance people don't know who turban people presume that everybody who wears a turban is Arab or Muslim which is not true so uh, this is my way of educating and at the same time also looking within our own community and making people think about our shortcomings and those kind of things. So this is, it looks like your first time at the MOCA. Yes. Are you having a good time? Do you think the response I is am, good? I mean, the response is great. People are coming in and, you know, they, they haven't seen turbans and beards and cartoons. So they're really, they're kind of, you know, they're really coming in and they're like, wow, I mean, so yeah, it's been a great response. Plus, I'm getting to see a lot of other people's work and it's quite amazing. Vishwajit Singh, SickTunes.com. My name is Morgan Pielli, and my website is MorganWritesABook.com. 
and I do a quarterly sci-fi anthology called Indestructible Universe Quarterly, which can be found on morganwritesabook.com to buy. And I also have a webcomic called Driftwood, which is a horror comic. And that's at morganwritesabook.com. We're the Rare Bits Comics Collective, and there's three of us. I'm Jen Vaughn, there's Sam Carbaugh, and Jason Week. And we're all friends uh, and cartoonists who have attended or are attending the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, Vermont. Yeah, just about this whole row is all CCS kids. Yeah. <laughs> and we all decided that we wanted to uh, control our own destinies with a webcomic and uh, have a, you know, instantaneous access to readers in a way that print comics sometimes takes longer to do. So that's sort of the reason we all did this. Yeah, I mean, you can feedback we, right away. You start... You can get it out to people and get responses for it, so it's really gratifying. Like, I've got a couple people who actually follow the comic and email me and actually care about it. So it keeps you moving forward, because it feels like people are enjoying your work, which, I mean, kind of what I like about it. And it sort of seems to be the way that print media could be going is that you uh, you have a webcomic. You can actually prove to editors and publishers how many readers you have using Google Analytics. And then they'll be like, I guess we could print you. I mean, we love your, sh- we love your stuff, too. Yeah. But- and uh, we also like to hang out and drink together, so it, it was a good way to also yeah. be productive. So it all works out. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. when well, we have a group website too, where we do just random posts and whatnot for fun, let's just do illustrations that just kind of blow steam off, and you don't have to worry about it being in continuity or the character models matching, or you know, I want to draw the Autobot symbol crying tears. So, yeah. <laughs> so Sam does. Uh, Here comes everyone. It's at samcarball.com. It's intellectual, political humor um, that takes place usually at a coffee shop. And then I um, I make Mermaid Hostel at mermaidhostel.com. It's exactly what it sounds like, uh, a bunch of mermaids in a hostel situation with the many mysteries and ill-fated troubles that come across. Ill-fated troubles. Yeah, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I do Billy the Dunce. It's basically just child geniuses running amok, doing whatever I want to so I can tell the science fiction or fantasy story or whatever that week. And it's available at billythedunce.com. Or duncepress.com. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Kat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.